Everybody's got different running forms, so I'm not going to tell them to do a specific running form. Uh, if you read the literature and you want to prevent an injury, you might say decrease vertical force, land on your forefoot, all these different things. None of that is necessarily true. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who really wants to visit Fiji, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 97 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for joining me in this second episode of 2019. What did you think of the different questions at the end of the episode last week? I would love to hear your thoughts. I think I'm going to stick with those ones. I kind of feel like it's something a bit unique, something different. And we can all take something from the advice. Melody had it last week. And uh, this week I have uh, my guest answering them for you today. So as I mentioned last week, we did have Melody Moore and it was our first episode of the year. So I wanted to start it off with some... uh, kind of confidence to help believe who in who we are, to feel good going into this year. And if you're someone who struggles with body image or confidence and you missed the episode, be sure to go back to it and remember to subscribe to the Running For Real podcast while you're at it. That way you won't miss future episodes. Today, I have a wonderful person, truly one of the nicest people. If you purchase my Coming Back From Injury podcast series, where I had seven experts give their advice on various topics for those who are struggling with injury, you will recognize Tom. He knows his research and you will hear him sharing interesting tidbit after interesting tidbit today in this episode. He genuinely wants to see runners succeed and stay healthy and I think his advice will be really important for us all to remember. Tom Michaud is a chiropractor, author and a true expert in the field of injury prevention. I think you're going to appreciate him a lot today. But before we get to the episode, can I just let you know, as I'm so excited, that Overcoming Amenorrhea is coming out in just under two weeks and it's now available for pre-order. You can either search for it on Amazon, click the link in the show notes or visit tinamuir.com, that's T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R.com forward slash pre-order to go get yourself a copy. By pre-ordering, you are giving Amazon a big hint that this book is anticipated and appreciated. I appreciate you for supporting me. Thanks so much. Let's go meet Tom. Tom, I am so excited and so honored to have you on the Running For Real podcast. I absolutely adore everything you do. And you as a person, I've told people who have purchased my uh, podcast series on coming back from injury, how amazing you are. And I'm really excited that the rest of the community now gets to hear it. So thank you for being here. Hey, not a problem. We're glad to be back. Yeah, this is going to be great. And, you know, there's a lot of things I want to cover today. These might be kind of specific um, when it comes to what exactly they are, but I think there's something that everyone is going to be able to learn from this. And actually, when you and I were talking before we started recording, uh, you gave me a few more ideas for things to talk about. But just to start off, you know, you are a chiropractor. Now, for people who are listening, maybe out side of the US or even in the US who think, what does that even mean? Is that just someone who aligns my back and I go in and they click, 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 and then I walk out again? Maybe tell us about um, what exactly you do and and why, uh, you know, chiropractors are so necessary in this world. I have one who I go to see regularly and, and why is that important? Well, I tend to not look at it as just spinal related in, uh, treatments. Um, it's the non-surgical management of all lower extremity injuries. And because we don't do surgical interventions, we don't do drugs, you really have to get people better by using manual techniques, especially exercise interventions. I use a ton. I, I do all the standard, you know, spinal mobilization, manipulation, lower extremity stuff, stretching, things like that. But I really feel that I specialize in, and I want a lot of other chiropractors to specialize in, the use of exercise intervention to get people better. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned lower body injuries, uh, lower body um, work. Is that, where where do you class lower body? Because again, like people kind of assume chiropractor means back, but 
you know, it's back. I wouldn't well, I consider actually back. specialize in lower extremity injuries, foot, mm-hmm. ankle, knee, hip. I grew up in the orthotic industry. My mom was one of the first employees at Langer Orthotic Laboratories a long time ago. Okay. So I started working in an orthotic lab when I was 14, 15 years old. Oh, okay. So I was going to go the route of becoming a podiatrist, but I like doing whole body. Like, again, I do half of the people I see are for lower extremity, a third or um, upper extremity. I see a lot of shoulder injuries and tennis players. So it's just, it's whole body biomechanics. And that's what's so fun about it to me. It's like, if you're a specialist, say you're an orthopedic surgeon and all you do is knees, you just see knees Mm -hmm. day in and day out. And what I like about chiropractic, especially if you do sports medicine, you have to know three-dimensional movement patterns of every joint in the body. You have to know muscles, origins, insertions, actions, innervations. You have to be able to differentially diagnose if you get an MRI and there's a stress reaction in the femoral neck. You have to be able to like couple all different aspects. So it's treating the entire person. And then also there's the nutritional component to it. A good chiropractor is going to know a lot about diet. They're going to know a lot about ways to manage injuries to accelerate recovery through diet. So it's 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 a lot of fun and it's looking at the body as a whole, just not saying, OK, you need your knee scoped. And I tell you, the more time goes by, the more research is showing that the conventional approach like arthroscopy for older runners with a little knee or OA osteoarthritis, it, those half of those interventions don't outperform placebo. One study showed the corticosteroid injections for um, facet or joint injuries didn't outperform placebo injections. Epidurals don't outperform placebo epidurals. And uh, several studies with 300 people in each group, one group of 300 got arthroscopy for meniscus tears and debridement where they cleaned up the joint. Average age was 58 years old. The next group of 300 but people, they put the scope in but didn't do a thing. Same outcomes in both. So, you know, I'm, as I'm getting older, the athletes I treat are getting older. So I spend most of my time discouraging people from getting uh, orthopedic evaluations and encouraging them. A guy named Bossomworth did a beautiful study where they looked at best ways for people with knee arthritis to recover. They looked at synovial injections, cortico, corticosteroid, non-steroidal um, interventions, and exercise intervention outperformed all of them. And the author of that study said, this is the safest, most effective treatment intervention for managing an arthritic joint. And a lot of older runners are dealing with one joint or another that's bothering them. And exercise intervention, and what that study showed was even severe arthritis responded to exercise intervention. And that gets into some other research. I don't want to go off cue too quickly, but they, when they look at people with arthritis, American College of Sports Medicine says, well, yeah, they need to strengthen because a quad weakness, for example, is the best predictor of accelerated knee arthritis. Um, rotator cuff weakness predicts arthritis in the shoulder. So American College of Sports Medicine says you have to do four sets of 12 repetitions at heavy weights with heavy weights. And a lot of new research, 2017 and and even more recent, is showing that if you do four sets of 25 with very short rest periods in between with light resistance, you get the same strength gains. So four sets that you mean, so 25 repetitions, four sets. And and when you say lighter weight, what kind of weight are you talking about? 35% 35% body weight. So okay. by body weight, that's a standard formula. 100% full effort uh, means you would do 100% instead of body weight, I meant full effort. When you do 100% full effort, you couldn't lift a weight a second time. So if I wanted to do a 50% full effort, if I could do a bicep curl with 100 pounds, mm-hmm. I would be doing a set of, a set of if, if it's at 35%, I'd be doing 35% of that. So with the research they're showing is that if you have someone who has, say, knee arthritis, they can't lift heavy weights, you go to 35% full effort, which is, you know, you can do 25, but you'd have a hard time doing 30. That's another way of looking at it. Um, 15% full effort, you can do 60 repetitions, but you couldn't do 70. So basically, you want to be fatigued by the time you've hit your 25th repetition, wait 30 seconds, and that, that short rest period was key, then do it again and do that four times in a row. Oh, very Beauty interesting. Of that, it's quick. The reason that works is that when you only give the person a 30-second rest, you don't allow blood to go back into the muscle. 
So instead of using their type 1 muscle fibers, the slow twitch fibers that can go forever, and the type 1 muscle fibers, the slow twitch, tend not to reproduce and make a muscle stronger. They can make you aerobically more fit. But by taking very short rests, blood can't get back in. So it forces a shift from your slow twitch to your fast twitch fibers. Normally, you only use your fast twitch fibers when you're going to full effort. That's why all the research said you got to go to full effort to produce muscle mass. But with that short 30-second rest, you can create that shift, create more hypertrophy, more thickening, more lengthening of the fibers. And it's, it's easy to do. They did a study on older people with knee arthritis. They had them do the 35% full effort routine, and they had measured muscle volume with MRIs. They had the same amount of increased muscle mass as the people using heavy weight with no injury rates. Wow. So a few things I want to ask you about that. Uh, One, you said about muscle mass increase. Now, I just want you to clarify for for the women particularly listening, but for the men too, you're not talking about, you know, bulking up. If if anyone does strength training, either heavy lifting or what you're suggesting here, they're not going to bulk up and suddenly end up, you know, like uh, some like beefcake man who is Correct. in the gym. Yeah. Correct. No, you don't bulk up. To bulk up, you have to have increased testosterone levels. You have to have all these other things. And, and keep this in mind, and this is important, that as we age, once you hit 35, you start losing about one half percent of your muscle mass annually. And once you hit 50, you start losing one to one and a half percent of your muscle mass each year. So they showed that um, hunter-gatherer societies didn't lose muscle mass at the same frequency that people in modern societies do. So whether you like it or not, you've got to do strength training to keep the strength you have now. And I'm not talking about building a like a ripped muscle, although some people want that. I'm talking about maintaining your current number of muscle fibers. Okay. For example, the average quadricep muscle has 320,000 muscle fibers. A guy named Campbell Campbell counted them once and he counted them. You said he counted them? Yeah, yeah, he did it in a laboratory. Yeah, (laughs) but he was a guy who did research and it's the reason that I started looking up. I wrote an article on it. It's on humanlocomotion.org on the best ways to um, avoid age-related muscle loss. He counted quadricep muscle fibers in 18-year-olds and he went all the way up until 80-year-olds. Between the age of 50 and 80, you lost about 200,000 of those muscle fibers. You, oh. you lose, you know, up to half your muscle fibers between the age of 50 and 85. So when you say you lose them, what does that mean? They disappear. Like literally disappear or just kind yeah, of become you, useful? It's called, sar- it's called sarcopenia, yep. um, wasting of flesh, If you, which is kind of creepy to say. But if, if you go into an old age home and you look around – you see people where there's no muscle mass left on them. Yep. And that's that's age-related decrease of muscle mass. The fibers themselves just start to break down. They're constantly in a process of remodeling. And this, I thought this was interesting. A guy named Booth did a paper where he was trying to figure out ways for um, people to like not lose muscle mass as they got older. And another person, um, Paquette from University of Memphis, showed that as runners age, they lose a disproportionate amount of muscle strength in their calves. Uh, When they looked at young runners versus older runners and they looked at force output in different joints, they had the same force output in their hips, same force output in their knees, but they had an 11% decreased force output in their ankles and feet. Mm. And he theorized that this is what Booth did. He said, our DNA was was written about 200,000 years ago to remodel muscles at a constant speed. Just like you make a red blood cell every 120 days, you remodel bone every six months. You're constantly breaking down muscle and remodeling. He said, and I, I know he's right, is that you need a certain input in order to stimulate your DNA to build cells called satellite cells when they're told will add muscle fibers in length. They'll, they'll attach them to the end and it's a constant repair process. And he, he said that if you don't add that, that stress, then you don't remake them. That's why he looked at modern hunter gatherer societies and they did not lose muscle mass. But what I found fascinating was that the runners, you would think because runners are running all the time that they wouldn't lose muscle mass I feel what happens is they lose the the accelerated muscle loss in their calves because our DNA was written when we were barefoot. Mm. 
And we didn't start wearing running shoes or runners. We didn't start wearing shoes to 27,000 years ago. When you were originally 100,000 years ago, when you were running barefoot, there was a lot more muscle activity because when you stood, stepped on a pebble or something uneven, your toe muscles fired with so much force that they offloaded the entire forefoot. That's why when they looked at skeletons from 100,000 years ago, they never got arthritis at the base of their toes because they were using their toe muscles so strong. They got arthritis in the tips of the toes. They didn't get bunions. They didn't get neuromas. They didn't get metatarsal stress fractures. They got little bits of arthritis in the tips of their toes because they pushed down so much. Mm. So some, some people feel because we're not stimulating the receptors on the bottom of our feet, we're not using our, our calves at the same force. So that's why middle-aged runners slow down just a little bit. It was an 11% reduction in force output wow. in their ankles. Yeah, it was kind of neat. Uh, so many good things. And now you guys listening see why I just love Tom and what he says, because, I mean, talk about knowledgeable and giving us you know, not just relevant information, but interesting information here. And there's so many directions I could go um, from here. But one thing I want to ask you first is, um, so just before we go on back to the strength training, could you literally take, um, so let's say someone see uh, finds a routine uh, that seems to work for them, a strength training routine, but the person that they're following or using you, uh, uses heavy weights. Can you literally take an exercise that is considered a, you know, a heavy lifting exercise and make it into the, um, you know, the, using the lighter re- lighter weight, but more reps uh, kind yes. of structure? That's a great question. And someone actually studied that. They measured muscle volume in young athletes. Most of the studies I was talking about were done on older people because if they try to lift heavy weights, mm. they get injured. Mm-hmm. And one guy did a study of 75-year-olds who never lifted weight ever, and they did this slow movement, four seconds up, four seconds down with body weight, like knee push-ups, things like that. And they had significant increases in muscle mass. No one got hurt. There were 87 people in the study. They all did it. But someone took young athletes and gave them the conventional heavy weight protocol for four times 12 at 70 to 90 percent full effort and then did the four times 25 that's actually where i got it from most of the studies on the older people did um different uh, repetitions where they did like four second holds with body weight the people who did the four sets of 25 of the same exercise but did it slower with the short weight actually built more muscle mass Mm. so and that was measured with mri they did cross-sectional areas and showed that they increased muscle volume okay all right great thank you for explaining Okay, I want to ask a question as you were just talking about calves and and bare feet running. uh, A question from one of my Patreon members, Mike. He said that he'd been reading a blog post of yours um, where you made a comment that running while barefoot strengthens the toes and arches. But we see a lot of injuries that kind of occur from regular shoes to quote unquote minimalist shoes. Um, So he said, if we work on foot and toe strengthening exercises, can we reverse this trend? Or has our forefoot kind of already gone down that path of being um narrowed and kind of like you mentioned uh the the changes that have occurred is it too late to to work on it yeah if you have a narrow for the all your entire skeletal structure is constantly changing shape as you grow um and you can physically change the shape of the structure like For example, ballet dancers, if they start dancing when they're five years old, Mm -hmm. they can create a rotated, a bony rotation in the hip called a retroverted hip, where the hip turns out 90 degrees so they can do toe out without hurting their knees. Mm -hmm. Most people only have 45 degrees of natural um, toe out in their hips. So if if they wait until they're 20 to start doing it, they can hurt their knees. The same is true with barefoot running. If, If you've got the good fortune to have a wide forefoot, you'll distribute pressure really well. And that was the research I was talking about with the um, barefoot barefoot from birth populations and the skeletons going back 50,000 years. They have four feet that are 16% wider. The bony structure is, is physically wider and their toes are wider. So they can tolerate more force with less risk of breaking down. If you have a very narrow forefoot, in my opinion, you can strengthen until you're blue in the face, but you're going to have trouble transitioning to barefoot running. And unless it's, you're something that you're really set on, I would caution against it. There's a certain type of person who does great with minimalist training. They have very flexible calves. They have a wide forefoot. They've got a muscular arch. And, you know, most people can make that transition. And I, I think as long as you're not you know, doing high mileage, it's a smart thing to do. 
you need strength in your intrinsic muscles of your arch. A paper just came out on plantar fasciitis showing one of the biggest predictors of it was an excessive pronation. It explained why orthotics don't always work. It was toe weakness, calf tightness, and, and weakness of the muscle on the outer side of the leg, the peroneal muscle. Mm, this is this is so so interesting and so good and just uh we're going to talk about plantar fasciitis in a second actually but uh with so you're saying when someone we talked about someone's foot being narrow mm-hmm. how would someone know if they have a narrow foot is that just kind of if you've been running in traditional running shoes um that you will naturally have a narrow foot or are you talking literally kind of you know on the range of averages someone on the you know the thinner end of the foot i'm just thinking like um, you know, my, my husband is actually, uh, after following, uh, and listening to, um, Mark Cucuzella for years, he's been transitioning to kind of running barefoot and has got up to an hour and you right. can see the strength and how much his feet have spread out over the time. But, um, you know, maybe he is just one of the people that you talked about who naturally has been able to, but could someone who has been running in like traditional shoes kind of go to a minimalist style shoes, maybe like an ultra or a topo, uh, kind of get their feet used to that style and then kind of transition to, to barefoot? Or are you saying that in that situation as well, you you, may, you know, maybe you don't recommend it unless someone knows for sure they'll be okay? No, Mark's a great guy, isn't he? He also has a, like a very wide forefoot and he's got a very muscular arch because he can run marathons barefoot. Mm-hmm. And what I was talking about before is the average foot stops growing when the person is 13 years old. Okay. So th- the width of your forefoot can vary until you're around 13. Then after that, as you probably noticed, after pregnancy, your foot gets a little wider. As you get older, your foot gets a little wider. That's ligamentous laxity, allowing the bones to spread out a little bit. That's different than a structurally wide foot. Okay. So unless you are, and everybody who has a narrow foot, they're aware of it because they've never been able to get shoes to fit. Okay. Unless you are aware that you have a narrow foot, I think transitioning to minimalist, especially for training periods of time, is phenomenal. Okay. You know, there's there's all these different ways to strengthen your feet. And, you know, minimalist, at first, the early research showing the injury rates were high. But when it's done right and people are, are cautious about it, it's a great way to strengthen the arch. Okay, great. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Just wanted to clarify that as um I, I, you know, I don't have a narrow foot or anything like that, but I wasn't sure like what, what is class to narrow foot? Most high end runners don't. Most high, most people who run marathons don't have narrow feet. They would have been injured. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Okay. And you mentioned about plantar fasciitis. Um, I did have another question from Mark. Um, he wanted to know about plantar fasciitis. He said, I wouldn't wish this on my, um, on anybody, but, um, it seems, like once someone gets plantar fasciitis, it is kind of a thorn in their side or their foot, he said, for life. Um, <laughs> he said, you know, can, is it possible to to kind of leave pl- uh, chronic plantar fasciitis for good? Or is it just something that's always, you're always going to have to be careful of? That's a really good question. And I think the answer to that lies in the fact that most people don't know the origin of it. Okay. And until recently, um, I have always treated it by increasing ankle range of motion, strengthening the intrinsics, orthotics, et cetera. But someone about a year ago published a beautiful paper where they took 200 plus people with chronic plantar fasciitis slash heel pain and compared them to 70 controls. They looked at body weight, occupation, how much time they spent on concrete, how much their foot pronated, how much their foot supinated, ankle range of motion, hip range of motion, everything. It was the most thorough paper on plantar fasciitis ever done. And what they found was decreased ankle mobility. So stretch your calf, wear night braces, things like that. Oh, so you we, do recommend those just while we, you're going through that, the ones that oh, pull yeah. your foot back? Uh, yeah. Your toes to, back, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like the Strasbourg sock, if if that's the one you're talking about. The, I like, there's a, a night brace called the Cub. It's a plastic one. I don't like, the Strasbourg sock is a long sock that pulls the toes back. In my experience, most patients who try it find it relatively uncomfortable and compliance isn't as high. If you can wear it and it's comfortable, that's fine because it's okay. not that expensive. But they sell a night brace called the Cub. Okay. It's just this plastic boot and it just holds your foot in 10 degrees dorsiflexion, easy to sleep when it's comfortable. Okay. That's my favorite night brace, plus a series of calf stretches. Okay. I will put links to that in the show notes. And um, 
the uh, articles Tom mentions as well. Okay, so that so sorry, you were saying things like that that helps. Um, and stretch- the other thing that that study showed was that uh, toe weakness. They had decreased strength in the intrinsic muscles of the arch. And that's something you and I have talked about. Mm -hmm. If you're weak in the intrinsic muscles, especially flexor digitorum brevis, it's that long, thin muscle that sits Mm -hmm. over the plantar fascia. Uh, Up until recently, and even to this day, 99%, 99 plus percent of doctors ignore it. But the plantar fascia sits right beneath the flexor digitorum brevis. They look like one another. They're like if you put your two hands together horizontal. Plantar fascia is on the bottom, flexor digitorum brevis is on top, and flexor digitorum brevis, when it senses pressure in the plantar fascia, which the plantar fascia is loaded with special receptors that send signals regarding tension, um, it fires to offload the plantar fascia. So it's called variable load transfer. When you go into your push-off phase, if you're running uphill fast, it's seven times body weight going through your plantar fascia. And the plantar fascia is there to take stress off the muscles, but it can only do so much. Yeah. So so when it's when the flexor digitorum brevis senses it, it tightens to protect it. If you're weak in that muscle, all that load goes right back into the plantar fascia and you start to get tears in it. So when they took 10% of the population who gets plantar fasciitis, when you said everybody, they go chronic, only 10% go chronic. If it's managed well early on and you do the right thing, there's a 90% success rate the first three months. I actually think plantar fasciitis is pretty easy to treat. But if you're part of that 10% that goes chronic, nine times out of 10, it's because no one looked at your flexor digitorum brevis strength. And I made this little device that measures strength. And... The, the other thing that was in that study that was I wasn't expecting it, and I've been doing this for a million years, peroneal weakness. Mm-hmm. The muscle on the outside of the ankle, um, peroneus brevis and peroneus longus is above it. Um, they're very important with running during your push-off phase. Peroneus longus is from the outside of the knee. Uh, it's on the outer side of the leg, just below the knee. runs all the way down under the outside of the ankle and wraps under the foot to stabilize the base of your, your first metatarsal which attaches near the big toe, it pulls down during propulsion to transfer pressure into that first metatarsal, which is your inner forefoot. The inner forefoot, the first metatarsal, it's a bone that's twice as wide and four times as strong as any other metatarsal. And your big toe, the hallux, can can unload the central forefoot by 40%. So if you're strong in your peroneals, it turns out that they push your inner forefoot down and offload your plantar fascia. Mm. They're really clever. I, I never used to give peroneus and longus exercises for people with heel pain. Um, now I always do. Yeah. In fact, ever since I read that paper, I, I check a ratio. It should be one-to-one between the inverters and the everters, the muscles on the inside of the ankle, the muscles on the outside. Everybody who has heel pain is weak on – they're right. It was a great paper. I'm glad they checked it. And it wasn't even – it's not even hard to, to measure. You just put – like you can put your hand up and have someone push out, and push in with the forefoot. It takes a second. So if someone is kind of dealing with either this chronic plantar fasciitis or maybe even some heel pain or peroneal pain, you know, that's one injury. I, I, I've been very lucky in my life that I haven't had that many injuries, but peroneal, I dealt with that for two years and it was incredibly frustrating. <laughs> um, who, what is the kind of person that someone should go see who is most likely to be able to, to pick that out um, and maybe check it? Would it be a chiropractor? Would it be a podiatrist? What, what kind of um, expert would you suggest would be their best option if they can find someone near them? That would be a really tough call because I don't know many chiropractors. I don't know many podiatrists who check that ratio because the research is so new. Okay. Like you, you could literally so print call, off the research and take it with yeah, you to your <laughs> and say, do you have a muscle testing device? And could you do this for me? You know, most chiros I know would be happy to do it. If you sent a, especially if they did sports medicine, if you send a note to the office saying, could you check my ratio? Where they're, they're called dynamometers. You can just put a, a device that measures strength. You put it up the outside of the foot, say push to your side, then the inside. It should be one-to-one. You know, you could also just do the exercises and assume that you're weak in it. Okay. Um, so because, tell us about those exercises. Um, do you have information on your website about it that people can go on there and find it? Well, I made that foot strengthening platform and it was Yeah, enlarged. so tell us about that. Well, that has everything to do with the paper we were just talking about. When you look at people with chronic heel pain, they have weak toes, they have tight calves, and they have weak peroneals. So 
because if you had to do all the different exercises all at once, it'd be a series of therabands, it'd take you forever. So I made this small foam platform. It tilts, if your forefoot was on it, it tilts back 10 degrees, it tilts out, so it pitches in the center like a tent, Mm -hmm. it tilts out 10 degrees, and then it cocks your toes back 25 degrees. And this is important, and I'll I'll be quick because I can bore people with this stuff. (laughs) When you push down with the tips of your toes, say you're doing towel exercises or marble pickups or therabands, force peaks with a theraband or a marble pickup when the toes are in a shortened position. Exercises when muscles are in shortened positions don't produce the same strength gains. One study of theraband foot exercises with short foot six months, three times a week, physical therapist supervised, showed 0% improvement in strength after six uh, six months. And that's on the, the website. I can send you the reference for that. But when this guy Goldman took people, he had their toes cocked back 25 degrees and then had them do sets and reps in that position. They got four times the strength gains Uh. because when, when the toe muscles are stretched, which is the position they're in in real life when you're running, when you're going into your push off phase, your toes are cocked back 25 to 35 degrees and that's when force peaks. That teaches the satellite cells that are located inside muscles to say, hey, you need strength here. We're going to build more muscle. We're going to make more muscle mass. So you got significant strength gains. A friend just did a study of that Toe Pro platform. In 12 weeks, they got 300% strength gains wow. in the intrinsic muscle. Yeah, it was nice. That's so amazing. By, it was. Well, I was kind of expecting it because I've been measuring it. Yeah. I've been seeing the same thing. Well, what I mean is amazing. Congratulations to you for, for creating something that, that works that well. So that, I mean, that's no easy thing to do. And, and thank you on behalf of all the people listening who are now going to go buy the Topro um, for, for creating something like that to help. Not a problem. I've been making so many different things over the years. I started out with like little wooden platforms. If if I had all the different models of the things, that's what I like <laughs> the most about this. It's it's like the end result of a lot yeah. of different attempts. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fantastic. Well. And I was thankful that uh, Tom has sent me one, and it, it it is everything he talked about and more. Just it's it's a great tool oh, nice. and uh, nice to. It's, it's not that small. It's very light. It's quite small, so you can put it anywhere in your house and and not really see it. Um, as a distraction, but it's there when you need it. So thank you for, for creating that. I know that uh, many people will go uh, check that out and I will put links in the show notes. And, um, okay, let's move on. Um, you mentioned about, uh, issue running issues as we get older. Um, you said about how people are more prone to injuries. Why is it, um, the calf in particular that seems to struggle? Is it what you mentioned earlier about the, kind of the hunter gatherer, um, that they were running barefoot or what, why do calf or lower leg muscles seem to be the place that, that, uh, our body struggles. After Paquet came out with that study showing that there was no change in force output in the hip or knee, the only explanation for the 11% decrease in force output in the calf is the lack of stress based on what our DNA was structured to remodel to, mm-hmm. you know, it, again, when you look at hunter-gatherer societies going back 50, 60,000 years, the force output in their arch and toes was astronomical. That's why they had different bony structures mm-hmm. and they got different. They need not a single hunter-gatherer from 50,000 years ago ever had a bunion. You know, that's that's a new phenomena that is really the last, you know, 2000 years. And it's, again, the architectural remodeling based on stress to the joint. You know, as we age, older runners tend to get injured. You know, they don't get injured at that high a rate because they tend to be almost like survival of the fittest. I hate to say it. The, <laughs> people, the people who are still running when they're in their 50s have really good biomechanics. They've been running a long time. You're not getting knock knee people with weak external hip rotators. Um, you're seeing people who've sort of made it through a, a bunch of marathons and they just are biomechanically very well aligned. You get a little stiffer when you get older and you're more prone to like tendon injuries because your tendons are a little more frail, a little stiffer. But um, otherwise, you know, older runners can can keep going forever. So what about someone listening who maybe hasn't been running for, you know, years and years since they were, you know, teenagers, uh, but maybe they did pick it up later in life. They want to keep going. Uh, you know, they're maybe in their 50s, maybe started running in their 40s, uh, right. maybe don't have a perfect running form. What can they do to give themselves the best chance of, of being able to be out there, even with, you know, not perfect, a not perfect situation going on? 
Hey, you ask really good questions. <laughs> it comes <laughs> out. A, a paper just came out. It running. Everybody's got different running forms, so I'm not going to tell them to do a specific running form. Uh, if you read the literature and you want to prevent an injury, you might say decrease vertical force, land on your forefoot. All these different things. None of that is necessarily true. A paper just came out where they showed the single best predictor of running injuries is increased braking force. Braking force is when you your foot hits the ground when you're running. If it hits too far in front of you, it creates a braking force that sends a jolt up your lower extremity at 200 miles an hour and causes bones to oscillate at 40 cycles per second and it causes injury. So that's overstriding, right? Overstriding. Overstriding is it. Shorten your stride length, land with your foot like beneath you or a few centimeters uh, in front of your center mass if it were to drop to the ground. Just shorten your stride length or improve your ability to dampen braking force. The best runners you probably had when you were running a lot, probably had an eight foot stride length. You were when you were running fast, you were overstriding, but you have to overstride to run fast. That's my point in the couple of the books I've written. You can tell people run with a short stride, land with your foot beneath you, but you can't run fast when you land with your foot beneath you. And if if I get someone like you coming in the office that's injured, I'm not going to tell you to run with a three and a half foot stride length. I'll tell a 60 year old who wants to run forever to run with a short stride length. But with you, I'd say, learn how to dampen your braking force. When they look at the world's best runners, you have different ways to dampen, uh, walk real fast, have your foot hit the ground in front of you, and you'll, or even run downhill. Mm. You'll feel when you're going Going downhill, you feel that braking force oh, gets yeah, sent sure. to you. You have options. You can like absorb it in your calf if you're a forefoot striker. You can roll at the ankle if you're a heel striker. You can bend your knee if you want to absorb that force. But when someone looked at the world's best runners to see how they absorb that braking force, they had really good posterior rotation of the hip. When that lead leg hit the ground, they pulled back at the hip through pelvic rotation. And that dampened that braking force. That was the key. So if you have, if I have a 210 marathon runner in the office, if you did slow motion analysis of them, you'd see they have mobile hips and they can absorb force at the hip really well. In fact, not to go off track, I'll be quick. They did a study where they wanted to see what factors lead to injury. And we were just talking about a second ago. They measured core strength, core endurance, core volume, ankle range of motion, all this stuff. And they wanted to see who was going to get injured. They did a simple test to start. People were seated. And then they just put like a little dynamometer. You could use a luggage scale. They put it on the inside of the ankle while the person was seated. And while they were seated, they pulled inwardly at the ankle. And that measured strength in the hip rotators. If they couldn't generate 20% of their body weight, they had a huge injury rate. And that's because they lost control of the lower extremity while they were running. The whole leg turned in. They were more prone to being injured. Someone followed up with that paper two years ago. They took 500 people and did that test on them. And they watched them for one season as they played sports. They were looking for anterior cruciate ligament injuries. If you scored more than 20%, you you had less than a 1% risk of tearing your ACL. If you scored less than 20%, more than 7% tore their ACL which that's huge because yeah. it's not just ACL. Runners don't tear ACLs a lot, but they get tons of retropatellar stuff. They get kneecap problems. They get posterior hip stuff. I do that test on everybody now. In fact, I made a dynamometer to do it on human locomotion where you can just, it's a really easy thing to do. You could literally use a luggage scale. And if you, you were talking about before, if you should see somebody who has it, I'd send that paper to someone and say, do this test on me or you could actually figure out how to do that test on yourself at home because it only takes a second to do. And if you score weak with it, um, you're more prone to foot ankle stuff. You're way more prone to knee disorders and you're more likely to have hip problems. Okay. So we will put links to, to getting one of those as well in the show notes if someone wants to give it a try themselves or take it to your uh, local uh, medical expert to to do it for you. But thank you for sharing that. And I, I definitely agree that a lot of people do struggle with knee issues um, and uh, giving them a way to kind of figure out whether what is going on so they can, uh, you know, work to address it in the future is going to be huge. And um, when it comes to these running injuries, um, one thing I wanted you to kind of get, get the point across, I mean, you've clearly proved you're knowledgeable, you know the research, you've read it all. Often I and other people who are uh, kind of looked 
people look up to, I guess, often get asked uh, questions like, I have a pain in my foot or my, I have a pain in my knee. Um, what do I do to uh, fix it? And, you know, why is it not as simple as pointing to, you know, an area of your foot and saying, this hurts, what do I do? Uh, why is it not that simple? Because everything's connected and that's where it gets complicated. If you were in the, the last chapter of the human locomotion book, I took 35 common lower extremity injuries and I gave the most common cause for them. You know, like if you have a metatarsal stress fracture, probably 80 or 90 percent of the time, you've got a tight calf causing an early heel lift, causing the bones to bend and weak toes. And to me, that's the whole puzzle of doing this job. Yeah. And as decades go by, more and more information is out there. You know, I've, I've 30 years ago, I used to treat a lot of elite runners and the interventions we did then weren't nearly as good as the interventions that are out there now, mm -hmm. you know, that you can get people back relatively quick. There, there are formulas, nothing simple though. It's not like you could say, oh, you've got a, a kneecap tracking disorder, strength in your inner quad. It turns out that the true answer is, are nothing like what original research was pointing towards. Like mm -hmm. if someone had a problem with their knee in the old days, they would have said, oh, you've got a weak inner quad. You need to do toe out leg extension. And it turns out that inner quad had nothing to do with it. It's hip rotator strength. Um, uh, keeping your hips strong and flexible is, is unbelievably important for um, doing well as you get older and keep maintaining calf flexibility and strength as well. And and is it a case of this is really something you need to find a medical expert you can trust and go see them, and then from there maybe get some physical therapy or find someone like yourself who has you know information and and ways to improve it, or is it something that um, you know? I just I know that a lot of people are probably not feeling hopeless, but kind of feeling if they are injured right now, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I, you know, I'm so confused. Maybe they've been to see a medical professional who they didn't feel good about, felt like they weren't taking them seriously. What would be your advice to that person? If they, they know they want to, to fix it. They know they want to improve and, and stop these injuries from happening, but they just don't know where to start. That's really rough because it depends upon the injury. It depends upon what's going on. It depends upon their overall health. Um, the best predictor of future injury is prior injury. Mm -hmm. So rehabilitating a prior injury perfectly is important. If you say you got plantar fasciitis and you treat it just by not running, uh, decreased activity or say worse, you put a, a based on an orthopedic referral, you put a boot on for two months. Um, boot immobilization causes 1% atrophy of the arch muscles per day that you're wearing it. Wow. After a month, it causes a 10% decrease in bone density in the tibia. I have seen more people, they go out to see their orthopedic specialist. The simple solution is to do an MRI and put them in a boot because it doesn't take any time to tell them to do that. And they don't mean to cause trouble, but in it, they inadvertently cause weakness of the arch and decrease bone density. The runner then tries going back without great guidance on how to get back. They re-injure something else. Say they get a crack in the tibia. In my opinion, the most important thing is find a knowledgeable person and help guide you through it because I try not to boot immobilize. I try to get people active as soon as possible. I never tell someone to, to decrease their activity. You just switch the activity. If you have heel pain, for example, and someone says swim, it's the worst thing you can do in the world because that will tighten the calf mm -hmm. and then you go out, then you get the early heel lift and you perpetuate it. Um, nine times out of 10, there's a simple solution to things but you got, you have to look at the whole picture. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And, uh, so you mentioned human locomotion, your book does have, uh, some chapters at the end that kind of give common injuries and, and what to do with them. So, uh, once again, I would recommend for people listening, if this is something you're struggling with, if you can't find someone near you, you know, the book might be a good place for you to start, especially if you've had quite a few things going on. Would, would you agree with that? Just uh, yeah, the, the, that book was for doctors, so it's a little technical. I wrote a book for recreational runners called Injury Free Running, and that would probably be the easiest thing. And it's it's, um, it's almost free if you get the ebook. Okay. All right, I will put links to that in the show notes. Okay, let's talk, let's switch gears and talk about um, you and I. Before we began, we're just talk, talking in general, and um, we were talking about 
you know, the core, the core, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, people often say, I want to work on my core. So let's yeah. talk about, um, core doing core exercises, but not in the sense of what people think, not doing sit-ups, not doing chin-ups or, um, V sit or whatever else people do. Um, but you have an article on your website about the diaphragm is actually the most overlooked core muscle. So tell us a bit about what you have found with that and why it's so important to strengthen the diaphragm. That's it's another great question. I wrote that article about a year ago because someone came out with a paper that showed that when you took chronic low back pain patients and gave them diaphragm exercise, and the diaphragm, again, if you think of the core, which is the internal, external, oblique, and transverse abdominis, the muscles that wrap around between your ribs and pelvis, the top of that is is the top of the core. It's the diaphragm. It's, it's one of the largest core muscles. If you don't have good tone in your diaphragm, then you're going to be unable to stabilize the torso with core strengthening. So these researchers took chronic low back pain patients, and instead of giving them conventional core exercises, they just gave them diaphragm exercises, and the outcomes were through the roof. They had less pain, more range of motion. They were able to get back to prior levels. And what you and I were talking about before, once every 10 years, I'll see a paper that comes out where they use diaphragm exercises to treat a variety of injuries. And the outcomes are really high, but you, it doesn't get a lot of attention. And then you don't see people doing it regularly. You were mentioning that your coach really emphasizes diaphragmatic strengthening. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's key. And this is a, a quick study I'll bring up. The people who did it were a little crazy as far as I'm concerned. They put sensors, electrical sensors in the, the core muscles, external oblique, internal oblique. And then they put sensors inside the diaphragm that measured activity. Then they looked at blood flow through the low back, the Wait, lower extremity. how did extremity. they put them inside? They uh, surgically insert oh, sensors. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, okay. No, they're intense. <laughs> this, is, this is intense. <laughs> then they measured pressure. They, this was phenomenal research. And you know, these guys have really put a lot of effort into it. But they measured blood flow to the low back using special machinery. And they showed that when you're running, when you're exercising, if your diaphragm fatigues, your central nervous system prioritizes the delivery of blood to the diaphragm over everything else wow. because you have to maintain a constant oxygen level. Um, and what they showed was if the diaphragm fatigues, your central nervous system panics and it shuts off blood to the, or decreases blood flow to the lower extremity. It decreases blood flow to your low back muscles and shunts it to the diaphragm so that it has a constant level of activity and a constant blood supply. Wow. That decreased circulation greatly increases the potential for a lower extremity or back injury because it impairs your awareness of muscle position. Not to get technical, but muscles have spindles that are in them, and spindles give you position sense information, where you are in space, how fast things are moving. When you tap a reflex, you're actually stretching a spindle, and then the spindle, the spindle goes, oh, we were just stretching, and it tightens. So that's like evidence that what spindles do. But more importantly, they tell your brain where everything is moving. Mm -hmm. If you impair circulation, even temporarily, you lose that sense and you have a delayed response to things. That's why the another person who did a paper on the diaphragm, were, these guys are from Belgium, they said sports happen, injuries happen in like the last two miles of a marathon. They happen in the last two minutes of a basketball game because if diaphragms are fatigued, it draws blood away from the extremities and people don't really know where they are in space, so they're more likely to get hurt. Really clever. So that's why all the research that shows with, with diaphragm strengthening, you one of the side effects besides maintaining a constant core pressure is you allow for improved circulation to the lower extremity when you're fatigued. That's so interesting, and uh, you know, I, I, it's so it's blows my mind that there's, as you said, not really much attention brought to this because I know it's not, it's not glamorous. It's not a, a quick fix, although I guess it kind of is a quick fix if you do the, the breathing correctly and often. Um, but it's not kind of in the traditional sense of, you know, do this one thing, uh, leg exercise and it'll work, but just, you know, so interesting. And I will put, um, links for everyone listening to, uh, the video that Drew and I did on how to breathe diaphragmatically. I have to say that slowly as that word is <laughs> such a hard word to say. Um, but 
it will only be available to superstars members so make sure you're in the community there but um i will put links to that if you want to give that a try and um so it, is it just a case of doing some diaphragmatic breathing or what other things can people do if that is something they want to prioritize, particularly if they feel like what you are talking about is something that could be a weakness for them? I mean, I know breathing for me in my in my past, and I have to admit, Tom, right now too, I have not been the best at it um, the last few months and I can really tell. Um, my husband is not happy about that at all because he can see it too, but... Um, <laughs> I just haven't, I haven't been working on it as much oh, as I should. It's, so you got other things going on. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, definitely isn't easy to, <laughs> to prioritize that when I've got limited time and that's just me being honest, but what, is it just a case of putting some time aside to breathe in that way or what other things would you suggest? Well, that's a, a an important point because uh, the same researchers from Belgium I was just talking about looked at different ways to strengthen the diaphragm. And when you, it, it, it's moderately simple, but when you inhale 60% of the force, the diaphragm looks like a parachute and it just lowers itself to draw air into your lungs. 70% of the force with an inhale comes from your diaphragm. 30% comes from rib expansion. So when you're lying on your back and you take a deep breath, you should see your belly, your abdomen mm-hmm. lift up a little bit. But you, to do true diaphragmatic breathing, you do the G, the G component of that, which is why you had trouble. To do true diaphragmatic breathing, you shouldn't have your ribs expanding. Uh-huh. So the, to coach people on diaphragmatic breathing, you just have them inhale so their belly goes out, but no rib movement. So you yeah. have them put their hands on their ribs. But this is what they studied in Belgium. They looked at people who just did conventional diaphragmatic breathing where they had, you know, just resistance and they did it over and over. And then they had people do it against resistance. And unless you applied 60, remember we were talking about full effort before, Mm -hmm. unless you did 60% full effort, you didn't strengthen the diaphragm. So they sell like power breathe sells this thing that uh, provides resistance when you inhale for less money. There's if you go look on Amazon and you look at power breathe um, uh, diaphragmatic strengthening, they sell this inexpensive one. It's like thirty dollars. It looks like something a snorkel person would use. You just put it in your mouth. You tighten it a little. Uh, to provide resistance and then you inhale so that it's moderately difficult and you do two sets of 30 repetitions and just like we were talking about before with the sets of 25 you should be fatigued when you finish your 30th one that protocol produced massive diaphragmatic strengthening okay I will put links yeah. in the show notes for that for sure to give. You're going to have a lot of links there. People aren't going right. to be able to get through it. You better make sure you go to the show notes with this one, listeners, because uh, this, if you're running right now, you're not going to re- be able to remember all of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but some, something that is so important, that is why I wanted to cover it. Okay, I think we are going to wrap it up here and we are going to move on to the Running For Real 4. So we're just going to take a moment and we'll be right to those. Friends, my book comes out in just over a week. How is that even possible? Even more crazy, my goal race, the Walt Disney World Half Marathon is tomorrow. Can you believe it? I can't. That also means Bailey is just a few days from turning one, one whole year old. Now you know I shared my story as I was going through it and my decision to stop running to get my period back, you also know about by now. I kind of became the face of a menorrhea. Yeah, I had it for nine years and I kind of deserve that title, but I worked really hard to bring awareness to it so people like me and maybe like you didn't have to feel like something was wrong with them. Maybe it's not you, but maybe it's a friend, a daughter, a sister who's going through this secretly feeling like they're broken. I hope you will support me by purchasing a copy either now through pre-order or when it comes out on January 21st. And I know with the million million things you may have going on right now, it might not be easy to remember that. So I can remind you if you want to sign up for my email newsletter at tinamuir.com forward slash subscriber. But before you switch off, let me first say my email newsletter, I know that phrase kind of brings about a sense of creepy, like leave me alone, stop bombarding me every day or multiple times a day. I know I don't need to let you know every time one tiny little thing changes. Hello, Express. Does anyone else sign up for Express emails? They drive me crazy. 
I am telling you though, my email newsletter is once a week. That's all, although there may be just a few extra around the book release. It's just me sharing something to get you thinking, a challenge, and of course, some updates, which is where I will remind you that the book comes out. You can sign up at tinamuir.com forward slash subscriber, or you can pre-order by going to tinamuir.com forward slash pre-order, and that will take you to the Amazon site where you can pre-order. Thank you so much in advance. Your support means the world. All right, Tom, just one oh, one more question, four more questions for you, starting sure. with one piece of advice you would like to give the listeners for life. Oh, that's a tough one. You know, it's uh, one piece of advice. I'd say find something you enjoy doing in life and, and do it. I love that. That's good. Nice and simple and, and very true. All right. One person that I, I'm not sure how much, how active you are on social media, but um not very. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't think so. We usually email, so that's why I figured it was uh, yeah. going to be an interesting question. But uh, anyone you suggest kind of following either on social media or maybe just looking at their website, who would be one person to go follow? No, I, I hate to say this, but I really just go to journal sites. I don't really follow any particular individual. So I is, just... there, is there a particular um, researcher right now who is just churning out, um, you know, yeah, good, good question. study after good study? Anthony K. K A Y E is from the United Kingdom. He has done some phenomenal. I think he's probably my favorite researcher in the last ten years. Okay, cool. All right, I'll put put links to that as well. All right, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, just as being a, a hard working person who's nice. Oh, you are absolutely that. The definition of those words. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, Finally, uh, what do you tell yourself either on the start line if you are going to race or maybe before a presentation, maybe a, a being a, spe a speaker at an event? What do you tell yourself? Well, I have this massive fear of public speaking, so that's the best. I tell myself it will be over soon. <laughs> I guess that works as effective and, and, and true. So, um, okay, Tom, where can people find out more about you? You mentioned humanlocomotion.org. Uh, anywhere else you would suggest or is that the no, that's place? the site. That's the site. I don't have a big social media presence, so it's just humanlocomotion.org. All the articles that I refer to are up there. Um, and if anybody wants any of the specific ones that I went to, I'd be happy to send them the originals. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. This has been so interesting to learn from you. Um, as I mentioned, listeners, this this guy absolutely knows his stuff and I just enjoy talking to you so much. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Hey, you're my favorite person to do podcasts oh. with. So it's, it's a pleasure working with you as well. You're really good at this job. Thank you. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Isn't he great? What a mind he has there. And the research is not only helpful, but fascinating too. Tom truly has a gift. And I hope if his words spoke to you, you will go to his website and check out the Topro platform he talked about. We have one and we love it. There are links to that and everything else we talked about in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 97. And if you, if you don't mind, could you take a screenshot of this episode if you found it helpful and share it to your Instagram or your Facebook? You never know who might see it and might need it. Maybe they will, you will be saving someone from a lot of heartbreak down the road with injuries. Remember to order yourself a copy of my book, Overcoming Amenorrhea, if you want to be my new best friend on pre-order. If you haven't already, you can go find it on Amazon or find it in the show notes. Next week, we have a returning guest in Alex Hutchinson. Alex is very easy to talk to, and we're going to have a fascinating chat about his thoughts about breaking two hours in the marathon, what he did with the Nike Vaporfly shoes he was given, and a lot more about how to deal with pain in races. Until then, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.